I did. That I'll, was the verdict. You're, listen, you are absolutely right. We have this to live justice. with that verdict so that he can go this and live in his... OJ. Well, oh, this yes, is not about O.J. Oh, yes, it is. about O.J. Mary, this is about O.J. being able to justice. live in his uh, white this is about world. OJ. Why would a court system help cover up and keep from Mr. Simpson the telephone records which would prove his total innocence. Uh, friends, what this case really is, is that O.J. would like to return to what he perceives to be a white world. Um, go back and well, live in Well, we know racism won't allow well, that. Me, well, excuse me. You know, I'd like to know why O.J. only will date white women and not black women. Do you want, does that trouble you at all, Mary? No, it I mean, does not. This, oh, okay, well, freedom you know, of freedom of choice. Well, I I agree with you, but then what, why what problem women, do you have with that, Susan? That has nothing to do with anything. I have absolutely no problem with it. The problem you obviously I have, do. Excuse me, Mary. I have no problem with it. The problem I you have bring it up all the time. I, I've never brought it up, but Mary, yes, let me you tell have. you. Uh, and as long as certain segments of the public believe O.J. is innocent, and, and they do, especially as against the background of the revelations about police crookedness in L.A. The fallout from the LAPD corruption scandal is growing, larger than anyone had expected. The number of cases now under review are in the thousands, according to Dennis Plourd, who's handling the investigation for the public defender's office. My, my, my guess is somewhere between two and three and it, anything like this ever been done before? Not to my knowledge, not in my career at least. The reviews were prompted by the revelations of former officer Rafael Perez. He's told about planted evidence and bad police shootings in return for a reduced sentence on cocaine charges. 511 cases officer Perez testified in are now under review by the public defender's office. The other 2,500 will come from a list of 11 officers under investigation from the Rampart Station. You would think the Browns would want to release as often as is necessary these phone records in order to establish that O.J.'s defense is not true and, and lay to rest any doubts about O.J.'s guilt. But they're not doing that. And as long as they seem to the public to be playing it close to the vest and being secretive, segments of the public will believe that maybe O.J. is innocent. Let's get these phone records out there as often as is possible. But the idea that the police might very well be planting evidence, people like O.J. Simpson are taking to a far extreme. I'm talking about obstruction of justice. I just wish that someone would come forward with the phone records, be it the Browns, GTE, Dan Petricelli, Marsha Clark, someone. We have constitutional violations here, and I am here to stand up for the rights of all Americans to hear and know the truth. Who's got the phone records? Oh, well, GTE has the uh, certified copy. A GTE has no place in this. The best evidence in this case was kept out of this case. It's very simple. If Marsha Clark said that she had the telephone records, then all she had to do was to introduce them. Why were they kept out? Why was there a lie about the exhibits? So all, the, all they have to do is show the telephone records. All they had to do was ask Judge Ito for an order directing GTE to supply these records. It's very difficult to believe now, uh, three years after the verdict, that these records existed, that they knew about them at the time, and couldn't get them. And we also know now that Dita, um, Judith uh, Brown, or Nicole Brown Simpson's mother, uh, may not testify, and there will be a stipulation as to what she would have said in front of this jury, that the defense and the prosecution will agree that they will say uh, to the jury that Judith Brown will testify that she had a conversation with her daughter at about 9.40, 9.45. And, Ms. Clark, have you uh, consulted with uh, Mr. Cochran regarding these matters? Yes, Your Honor, we have. And have we reached an agreement? Yes, we have. All right, and what are the nature of the... Uh, you don't have to read me the stipulations, but what are the topics of the stipulations? Yes, the first stipulation is concerning the testimony of, of Judita Brown, concerning, uh, the, the court's, I think, familiar with the subject matter. Yes. The second would be stipulation concerning the admissibility of telephone records. Um, these concern the phone bills for the home telephone of the defendant and for Judita Brown. All right, the, this will be subject to our agreement that if at a subsequent time uh, there are phone numbers that are not relevant to the case, those will be redacted. Right. And my understanding, uh, that both sides reserve that right to object on relevancy and the fact that um, we want to maintain the privacy of these numbers if at all possible, and further, there are other people who may have made these phone calls other than the parties involved. All right. And the third stipulation. 
And the third stipulation concerns the photograph contained in people's 354, 358B, and 359, which I propose to, uh, when we read them to the jury, I want the, to be able to um, show the exhibits to the jury so they know what we're talking about. Yes, and I'd like to be heard with regard to uh, a 352 objection, a further 352 objection as to exhibits 354 and 358B uh, for the record, and then we can proceed with the stipulation. All right, then I and think we should, then I should hear the objection, 352 objections as to 354 and 358B. Let's start with 358B. I do have that in front of me. That the prejudicial effect of that photograph of Mr. Goldman and his injuries um, far outweighs any probative value. We felt that particular photograph was just um, beyond and above and unnecessary. Well, the photograph, particularly the one in issue uh, now with counsel, is very relevant to depict and to illustrate the testimony of Dr. Lakshman and the appearance of those injuries as the victims were found at the scene is critical to the foundation for his testimony and the formulation of his opinions. And so these, these are very intelligent people, Your Honor. They have, they, they have the numbers. They've seen Exhibit 354. Uh, it's a photograph of, as we indicated, Mr. Cole Brown Simpson, and 358B is a photograph of Mr. Goldman. Uh, with regard to N359 and what that is, it seems to me it's pretty clear of what these areas portray. These photographs have been up so many times in this jury, uh, and the court will recall that on a couple of occasions the jurors had to take time out because of the, uh, the nature, not necessarily these photographs, but, this, but some of these photographs uh, of the decedents. And so I just don't think we need that at this point. With respect to showing the jury the photographs we stipulate to, how are they going to understand what the stipulations mean or refer to if we don't? This photograph doesn't add anything, and it tends to be extremely gruesome and disturbing. You use those words yourself. So, And if we can't show them to the jury and we're entering a dry stipulation when it comes time for them to uh, look at the exhibits, they're not going to have any recollection at all. Uh, I, don't, I also would object further. I don't think this, the jury needs to see these again. They've seen these photographs before. Uh, I see no reason for that at this point. We're not going to show them any of the other exhibits at this point. And uh, we didn't show them the... Uh, we're not going to show them anything with regard to the telephone bills or whatever. So, uh, we're not going to show them anything with regard to the telephone bills or whatever. Uh, we're not going to show them anything with regard to the telephone bills or whatever. I want to bring one more, I understood, I want to bring one more thing into this mix. It's Dan Petricelli, who entered, who entered these phone records into the record in the civil trial as exhibit number 26. Listen to what he said to us yesterday about those particular phone records and our access to them. Listen. We do have the phone records. We have them. So why not I'd be them? happy to show them to you. They were shown to the, uh, to, uh, to the jury in the civil trial. They're there. Anybody can see them. You, you can be displaying them right now on a screen next to me had you asked me to bring them. If you don't mind when we're through here, I'm going to have a producer get on the phone with you. We'll get that stuff. We'll post it on our website. Okay. He said in the end there before they clipped it, okay. And as it turns out, uh, he told our producers afterwards that it might take a couple of days to produce those. Today, in a phone call with our producers, he said that, in fact, those records are the property, quote-unquote, of Lou Brown and that we couldn't have access to them without Lou Brown's permission. Now, they're never in a million years going to show that um, Judith Brown spoke to Nicole at 11 o'clock. Now, is there something in the report that indicates that one of your investigators had information from the mother of the decedent that she was alive at 11 p.m.? Yes. What information did you have? Uh, am, I, is, uh, am I allowed to testify in there? Am I, is, uh, am I allowed to testify in there? And, Your Honor, now I will check on the grounds that counsel is attempting to elicit hearsay. And hearsay of uh, a potentially unreliable nature. Okay. Did you see any information about a telephone conversation when you came to your conclusions? Phone records, I, I want to show you. Those phone go records, go, me going second, back. But those phone records show that the Browns were able to travel 75 miles in 45 minutes. I heard about a telephone conversation and, and did see it in the report. Who did you hear about it from? It's so, it's so ridiculous. The, the initial, uh, the initial uh, report of the uh, telephone conversation? Yes. I believe I heard it on the, uh, on the news or in the paper. Is that before you saw it in your report? 
Yeah. You mean the news had it on before it was in your investigator's report on the 13th? I believe the news used the investigator's report. Preliminary investigator's report. Are you saying the news read the report before you did? Oh, I would, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. And you would rather rely upon that than upon a mother's testimony oh. that she talked, or a mother's comment that she had a telephone conversation with her daughter? Who's got the phone records? Uh, Bill Hodgman, the DA, got <clears throat> the unprecedented order to remove um, all the evidence used in the prosecution of O.J. Simpson. Johnny Cochran, now a successful Los Angeles defense attorney and a close friend of O.J. Simpson's, hired Hodgman as a prosecutor in 1978. He's very well prepared, uh, very methodical, uh, ethical, and he's got a great track record. Uh, with regard to murder cases. Hodgman has tried nearly 40 murder cases and has been highly successful in most of them. And this is the world. Uh, if uh, Nicole was alive at 11 o'clock and making a phone call with her mother at 11 o'clock, O.J. could not have killed her because he was uh, uh, entering his limo and in his limo at that time. So it, it's critical. If, if these two very prominent attorneys uh, uh, stipulated they must have reviewed the telephone record, they must have been persuaded that uh, mm -hmm. there was no doubt that the phone call took place at that time. Otherwise, they would be committing malpractice, and certainly Simpson <laughs> has never been heard to accuse his own attorneys of malpractice, nor do I. Yeah, how could you ac accuse the Dream Team of malpractice when they got an acquittal? First stipulation, counsel, with respect to the testimony of Judita Brown. May it be stipulated that Judita Brown was called as a witness, duly sworn, and testified as follows. She is the mother of Nicole Brown Simpson, the decedent and named victim in count one of this action. At approximately 9.37 p.m. on June the 12th, 1994, Judita Brown telephoned the Mezzaluna restaurant and spoke to an employee named Karen Crawford. At approximately 9.40 p.m., Judita Brown telephoned her daughter, Nicole Brown Simpson. This was the last time that Judita Brown spoke to her daughter, Nicole Brown Simpson. Counsel, may it be so stipulated? So stipulated, Your Honor. Does the court Thank receive the stipulation, Your Honor? Thank you, Counsel. The court will accept, receive and accept the stipulation. Not only does Mr. Shapiro's offer to stipulate to the 9.37 phone call conflict with his previous offer of 10.17 p.m. in the judge's chambers, it is also in conflict with his statement of speaking to Juditha Brown on numerous occasions after the murders and being told by Mrs. Brown that she talked to Nicole at shortly before 11 o'clock. Shapiro makes this recollection on page 33 of his biography of the trial entitled, Search for Justice. The attorney says that in the course of the trial is not evidence. However, in a situation where the attorneys stipulate and agree to a certain fact, you were to accept that as evidence in the case, right? A second career on Court TV. Good evening and welcome to the show. Early in 1978, I would be the number three man I was sworn in as Los Angeles County's first African-American assistant district attorney. One of the first prosecutors we assigned to the newly formed hardcore gang unit was an unusually bright, hardworking young lawyer named Lance Eva. The point is that Marsha Clark submitted People's Exhibit 35, Dan Petricelli submitted Exhibit 27, and both of those are purportedly Juditha Brown's phone records for June the 12th, 1994, and those two exhibits in black and white demonstrate that the Browns were able to cover 75 miles in 45 minutes. So are and you frankly, suggesting, Doctor, that no, I've sorry. traveled from that point, from Brentwood to Dana uh, Point to the Browns home many times, and uh, at nighttime, uh, at that time of night, it is very possible to go that distance uh, in that period of time. And good morning, Jim. Southbound 405, slow away from victory into the spot with the past. Each day, Los Angeles drivers put up with some of the worst traffic in the nation. No matter which way I go, it's always bad. No matter what. No matter what time of day. So it may come as no surprise that L.A. has the number one bottlenecked intersection in the country, where Interstate 405 meets the 10. The worst traffic congestion in America, where the San Diego and Santa Monica freeways meet in Los Angeles, and drivers spend an average 20 minutes daily simply not moving. They need to make some big changes about the 405, man. Why is that? Traffic all day long, every day. No matter what time you're on there, it's always traffic. 
the uh, Browns may be a while before they get here because of the traffic up the 405, so we may be here for a bit of a duration. And we know that the uh, Brown family en route from Dana Point, California, and it could be a while before they get here. The Brown family lives about an hour and a half to two hours from here. The Brown family lives about an hour and a half to two hours from here. The Brown family lives about an hour and a half to two hours from here. But what I'd like to do is to take Gloria and Fox News on a challenge at any time of the day or night, and we will travel from Brentwood to Dana Point. If Gloria is able to arrive at the Browns residence within 67 minutes, I will surrender my medical license. But if Gloria can't do it, I would like for her to surrender her legal license to practice law in the state of California. And if she fails to take up the challenge, then I think that she and the Browns should move forward and release those phone records. We'd like to see these phone records. Pet I, I don't need to see the phone records because the attorney saw them in both cases. Uh, the jury has made their decision that in the civil case that Mr. Simpson is liable for the killing of Nicole and Ron. I think all of this may be part of an effort just to plant more doubt in the minds of the American public, but the majority of the American public has made up their mind. They agree with the civil verdict that he killed with malice. You know, this is a group of people, um, you know, that have to sell the American public on the idea that phone records were altered, LAPD tried to frame OJ, and you know, little men from Mars visit him uh, on a nightly basis. That, that, that has nothing to do with anything. So the question is, where are the official copies of the GTE phone statements, which were never introduced as evidence right. in this case? Hey, uh, this is a critically important issue. Uh, if uh, Nicole was alive at 11 o'clock and making a phone call with her mother at 11 o'clock, O.J. could not have killed her because he was uh, uh, entering his limo and in his limo at that time. So we all know what an official copy looks like. But I simply have forgotten that level of minutia. Something is wrong in this case. Former prosecutor turned millionaire author acts as an MSNBC legal analyst and substitute host on CNN. Well, you, you didn't know about those records? <laughs> you know, Dan. <laughs> I don't want to know that. Oh, <laughs> where were we? I mean, have before, you we have, we've done that. Have you subpoenaed these records yet? Yes. And the subpoena has not been complied with? No. Have you made a motion to a judge asking the judge to enforce the subpoena? A couple of times, yes. And has sir. the judge granted that motion? Not yet. Has GTE resisted the motion? Has anybody yes. resisted the motion? Yes. OJ's attorneys, as you said at the top of the broadcast, show up, back in court yesterday trying to clear OJ's name, trying to convince a judge to release phone records that they say will exonerate OJ Simpson. The judge denied their request for those records. The search goes on. When Doc Johnson started the group, was trying to get the phone records. They had been actively searching a lot of things. They're the ones that got all the doctors together and came to the conclusion that whoever did this was left-handed. Uh, they were trying to get phone records because they thought Lou Brown was accurate when he said the last time they had spoke to Nicole was after 11. This is a very simple thing, okay? We like to get the records, but the court and the Browns had to sign off. But why would you have to fight something as simple as that? If here's a phone record, you guys are wrong, it's over, <laughs> you know? Finally, a just verdict has been rendered in a case involving O.J. Simpson. Yeah. That's, it isn't enough. It that isn't is enough. I think we need to examine our mind as a community. Could our time and efforts and energy have been better spent on other issues rather than supporting O.J. Simpson, who, uh, who, who we all uh, understand now, and I'm sure most of us can agree, has been lying to us all along. Christopher Darden followed his Simpson case bestseller with a new book just out, Fiction This Time. He's racked up several acting credits, like this guest shot on the soap, Sunset Beach. All right, well, since when do you take on cases you can't possibly win? I found an order for joint custody of Trey until the case comes to trial. Now Americans know what most of us have long suspected, that even a charismatic, longtime sports idol and celebrity pitch man can be a murderer. It is obvious, based upon the autopsy reports, that two assailants were involved, the main killer is left-handed, and for a doctor to miss that, he would have to be an unmitigated, absolute fool. Right. Why would a court system help cover up and keep from Mr. Simpson the telephone records which would prove his total innocence? All right. My heart soars. My soul celebrates. Dr. Johnson, I'm going to give you the last word. These are very serious allegations that Attorney Petrocelli, as well as prosecutors, would tamper with phone records. Well, if anybody in the media or any lawyers have anything to do, anybody that has had anything to do with uh, the prosecution of O.J. Simpson, please produce the phone records. Um, Gloria, if you've got access,
access to the phone records, I'd love for you to produce them. Dan Petricelli, please come forward with the phone records. Marsha Clark, GTE, who, why is there a purpose to hide these phone to records? all Just come three of you, records. I want to thank you for being with me. I've got a funny feeling this is not the last we've heard of this lawsuit filed by O.J. Simpson. I think this case is still so fascinating to so many people. Well, you know, it personifies the ambivalence that America feels about a lot of blacks. Are they, you know, somebody that have really contributed to the culture, athletes that, you know, we aspire to, or are they some force that, you know, we're very, very much scared to? Aspiring actor, loving son, and young man ready for marriage. I have to spend the next, what, 50, 60 years of my life alone, knowing that the person that I was expecting to live with um, is gone. Delving into Ronald Goldman's background is like entering into a dark and mysterious abyss. Uh, particularly at the point that I found out that Ron Goldman had a six-inch criminal file. I was able to hold on to a docket sheet on one particular case that was included in that particular file that we were looking for. And the docket sheet alone tells an interesting story of Ronald Goldman, in my opinion. He originally was uh, stopped in 1991, in April of 1991, for reckless driving and speeding. Now, at the time that he was stopped, he was cited for driving with a suspended license, which means that he, was, he had been arrested before for driving with a suspended license. He also was given the charge of um, driving recklessly and driving without his uh, driver's license in possession. Interestingly enough, uh, a judge issued an arrest warrant for $1,000. He was arrested and brought to court. The judge uh, recalled the $1,000 arrest warrant and at that point in time dropped the most serious of the charges and told Mr. Goldman to show up simply for the purpose of being punished for driving without his license. Ron Goldman failed to show up over the next three and a half years and ran up gratuitous after gratuitous crime of fleeing the court, causing the court to issue over $16,000 in bench warrants and arrest warrants for his arrest for the simple charge of not having a license in possession. The strangeness of this would indicate to me that Mr. Goldman had very little respect for the authority of the courts. And on the basis of this, we wanted to look at his six-inch criminal file. He was a good human being, both on the outside and the inside. He cared about everybody that he came in touch with. Upon uh, locating that file, which was kept at the Malibu Municipal Court out in Malibu, California, the people who were guarding that file became very, very tenacious in terms of uh, not wanting to release all of the information that was in that criminal file. My experience with it was like I was entering a dark world and the people who were protecting this file, if you remember the movie The Devil's Advocate with um, Keanu Reeves and Al Pacino, all of the people in that courthouse, 
in 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 my mind's eye begin to turn into those type of demons. Ron Goldman's file is protected by California Government Code Section 6254, which we call the snitch law. It protects anyone who has been cooperating with law enforcement as a confidential informant. The interesting thing is that the media and officers of the court in the district attorney's office have, as well as the family, have carefully cultivated this image of Ron Goldman as being this honorable all-American boy. But in my opinion, based upon the records that I've been able to review, he was anything but this clean-cut all-American boy that they want the general public to recognize. Though the apple look rosy round the outside, yet you know that it's rotten on the inside. Ron Goldman's life parallels the life of someone else. And in my opinion, his last name should be Glass. He should carry the last name of his stepbrothers and sisters and his stepmother, who was formerly married to a Cook County district attorney by the name of Marvin Glass, who turned into a private attorney representing uh, drug cartels who wanted to do business in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois. Marvin Glass was described as being cocky, arrogant. Here was a man who had admitted that he had uh, contracted to execute his own business partner. Here was a man that was also involved in the same type of petty gratuitous crimes even though he had made millions in, in, in drug money. He was involved in having his own neighbor's houses robbed, breaking into his mother-in-law uh, Elaine Goldman's safe deposit box. When Marvin Glass was finally apprehended by the feds, he was given a choice of facing 200 years in federal prison or becoming a confidential informant. This man, uh, according to a judge who was sentencing him for his involvement in these illegal activities,